so we'll, we'll shift now to Joanna Moody. Uh, Joanna was one of the uh, principals in the uh, Mobility of the Future study that we released uh, last November. Um, and she is now what the program manager for the Mobility Systems Center. So she's been intellectually involved in, and, and now managerially involved as well as intellectually involved in, in this mobility sector for, for, for some time with us. Um, she's going to give some of her insights on, on uh, urban mobility. Um, so I, I want to preface this with, um, I am a social scientist with an engineering degree. And you've heard today um, an optimistic view of what might happen uh, post-coronavirus in the energy sector. You've heard a pessimistic view of what might happen uh, in both the energy and the mobility sectors um, after this coronavirus. And today I'm gonna actually give you a normative view of what we need to have happen in order to achieve our sustainable development and climate change goals. And I'm gonna focus on the decarbonization of urban passenger transportation. And I've said I'm a social scientist, so I'm gonna focus on what can we do with technology and what do we need from a behavioral science and a policy making side to complement these emerging and new technological developments uh, with a focus again on the urban mobility sector. And so we've heard that the energy sector is important for climate, meeting climate and sustainable development goals. The transportation sector is also a significant and actually currently increasing contributor to total CO2 emissions when you look globally. And a large amount of current transport emissions are coming from uh, light duty vehicles, or these are personal cars and light trucks. And there's really this question of, can we engineer our way out of this dilemma? We're here at MIT. We like to think about new technologies, development of new scientific discoveries, um, and new technologies such as alternative fuel vehicles can help mitigate air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions of transportation without needing to change our mobility behavior. This approach, this use of alternative fuel vehicles inextricably links the decarbonization of the transportation sector with the decarbonization of the energy sector. So in Bob's initial remarks, he had a Venn diagram of these different sectors and there was this inter interlocking between the transportation sector and the energy sector and in there was EV. That's where we're talking about. And I'm gonna illustrate this using some analysis done by the MIT Energy Initiative's SESAME model, which um, Bob has already introduced. And we're gonna look at the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions for different vehicle and fuel pathways. And we're gonna consider this from a full life cycle. So the extraction of raw materials that are then used to produce the vehicle, the entire fuel cycle, so producing whatever fuel or energy is used to power that vehicle, and then the use of that vehicle um, and the emissions associated with that. And we're gonna look at this um, comparing car models, uh, which we've chosen to minimize any differences that might come from non-powertrain features. So larger vehicles are generally less fuel efficient um, and other design elements may make them more aerodynamic. Um, they may have very different tires that reduce friction. So we're trying to eliminate those sort of confounding factors and choose vehicles that are as similar as possible. Um, you see here the interior volumes of these vehicles are almost identical across all of these different powertrains. And we're going to come look at the emissions, again, the, across that full life cycle for um, internal combustion engine vehicle, a hybrid electric vehicle, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, a battery electric vehicle, and a hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. And what we find is these, these numbers are run for the US under current conditions, um, that using average US electricity grid today, uh, battery electric vehicle life cycle emissions are about half of those of a comparable internal combustion engine vehicle. So if you choose to purchase and drive a battery electric vehicle, your emissions are reduced by about half compared to if you were driving a gasoline powered vehicle. Hydrogen, sorry, yeah, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles um, and hybrid electric vehicles are in between 
um, the emissions of battery electric vehicles and internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, the current number that you see here for fuel cell electric vehicles is based on hydrogen production from steam methane reforming without using any sort of carbon capture technology. But what you're going to notice when you look at these bars is that um, for current traditional internal combustion engine vehicles, the majority of emissions come from the, from the consumption of the fuel during driving. When you look at alternative fuel vehicles, the majority of the emissions come from the fuel production. And so what this means is that the sensitivity of or the overall greenhouse gas emissions impact of these alternative fuel vehicles is really dependent on the fuel production and the fuel cycle um, and how green is that energy sector. And I'm just going to highlight a little bit of these sensitivities. So that previous slide showed the baseline or nominal scenario. For the battery electric vehicle, we assumed the average US electricity grid. Now, if we consider the electricity grid of the lowest carbon energy intensity state in the US currently, that's Washington state, a lot of hydroelectric power, um, then you already are reducing the emissions ratio significantly. But if you compare that to the, a battery electric vehicle powered by the grid in West Virginia, which is the highest carbon intensity electricity grid, you actually see a four-fold difference in the overall life cycle emissions of a battery electric vehicle, depending on the grid intensity um, that is being used to charge that vehicle. And you can see very similar sensitivities, huge ranges, um, depending on what hydrogen production method you're using to power that hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. So in this case, um, the nominal being conventional steam methane reforming, but if you were to additionally add carbon capture, or you were to perform electrolysis with a very low intensity electric grid, um, you could get at much lower uh, emissions. And so with large scale adoption of alternative fuel vehicles and the simultaneous decarbonization of the energy sector, we can make major improvements in air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions from personal mobility. Now there's still a lot of um, challenges with this and we've highlighted some of them. Um, Professor Olivetti talked about the supply chains and the materials that are needed to produce the batteries for these alternative fuel vehicles, both battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles, uh, require um, fairly sophisticated battery technology. Um, but what about other externalities of our urban transportation system? And here I want to talk a little bit about why our sustainable development goals for transportation in particular, you can't really pull out uh, carbon emissions and local air pollution emissions from the discussion of these other externalities. And I'm going to focus particularly on congestion because that's what transportation engineers like to focus on. So I'm going to make the claim, and I've made this very strongly and will probably spark some uh, controversy, but technology that remains within the car form factor have limited ability to mitigate congestion and inequality. And so here you have an image of the amount of road space in a city that's taken up by 42 cars and the individuals that are often single occupancy within these vehicles making trips. So let's say this is the amount of space required to uh, serve these 42 people's travel. If those, all of those vehicles are electric, you can make huge gains on the emissions related to those vehicles, um, they still take up the same amount of road space. So we haven't solved a congestion problem. We could make those vehicles autonomous. And if they're still in a carb form factor, they still take up the same amount of space on the road. We can make them on demand. This could be an Uber or a Lyft car. So, and if we're not depicting the riders, sorry, the drivers, because those aren't trips that are actually being satisfied, if we're really only talking about the riders whose trips are satisfied, it takes up the same amount of space. So what does this mean? It means that these new technologies and services within urban mobility systems have a limited ability to impact all of these different externalities that we want to impact if they remain as a car. And that really, if we want to reduce our use of street space and also benefit from 
more sustainable travel behavior, uh, we need mode shift and behavior change. So here are the same number of people, 42 individuals. Um, and here's how much space they take up if they're taking a bus or if they're walking or biking. And I just want to mention that the current global lockdown highlights just how powerful behavior change in the transportation sector can be. Here is a street in India. Um, here is the same street. Um, on the left is the air quality associated with um, the mobility as usual. And on the right is that same street under lockdown. And you see that there are no cars on the road uh, and the air is significantly cleaner. And so this is sort of the highlighting the potential impact of behavior change in the mobility sector. Now, I'm not gonna argue that cessation of all movement in a lockdown is a sustainable solution, but it should prompt us to think about how can we make these gains while still allowing people to travel and have that travel support the economic and social lives that we want to live. And there's been a huge impact of the current situation on travel. Um, and I want to sort of demystify a couple of, of questions of sort of how are people changing their travel behavior and what might be the long-term consequences. Um, and so in cities around the world, we've seen travel drop precipitously. Um, much of that is voluntary, but a lot of it is also mandatory with lockdowns and other uh, types of government policy. For most individuals, the overall reduction in travel, so just I am taking many fewer trips, dwarfs any mode shift. So we are seeing that people are shifting some of their trips from one mode to another, uh, particularly avoiding things like public transport, but overall it's reductions in travel over all the modes. Every mode is losing trips. Um, Yet some modes are affected more than others. And Professor Knittel alluded to this, is that shared modes of travel, like public transit and on-demand mobility services, have seen the most rapid and sharpest declines in ridership and in use. Um, and in fact, the use of public transit has been discouraged um, by most agencies and in cities around the world, except for essential trips, uh, many ride hailing services have ceased their particularly pooled operations where you share your trip with another rider in the same vehicle. And many micromobility operators, these are operators of scooter share or lift or bike share systems have actually removed vehicles from cities or abandoned them. Non-motorized forms of travel, including walking and biking, have actually seen um, an improvement in overall sort of public perceptions they've been embraced as a healthier and safer travel option. Um, and those with access to personal cars continue to drive for about the same share of trips. Now the total number of trips have decreased. They're driving less in general, but their share of trips, the number of trips that they use by car is around the same. And now there are huge, there are variations in this across geographic region, but these are sort of the overall trends that we're seeing during the outbreak. Now the question is, we've seen differential um, impacts of the coronavirus on travel, and we're likely to see differential recovery um, post-coronavirus. And so there's really is this question of how is demand for urban mobility going to recover after coronavirus, and how might it look different from the pre-coronavirus situation? Now we have some early evidence from China. Um, in most cities, you can look at this graph of Shanghai, travel by private vehicle has recovered the fastest of any mode and congestion levels have actually already reached pre-COVID-19 levels in most cities when lockdowns are lifted. So um, this Shanghai graph, you see the, the light gray lines, that is the same, the traffic from the same time period um, in 2019 and then the red lines coming back up to them towards the end of March and early April um, are the 2020 numbers. Now the exception here is Wuhan, where traffic is still lagging behind um, the pre-coronavirus levels, um, and this is after lifting a 10-week lockdown. 
Some other anecdotal evidence has shown that um, use of e-bicycles or bicycles uh, remains higher than pre-coronavirus levels. So some of that um, perception of non-motorized transport, walking and biking, does seem to be persisting. Uh, we don't know how long that's going to be, but there is some initial evidence that that uh, might increase non-motorized transport mode share. Um, ride handling trips are starting to recover, uh, particularly commuter trips or necessary trips, but leisure trips are still lagging. So people are still avoiding crowded places, um, public places, and have not really reached their pre-coronavirus level of um, leisure and recreational activities. And public transit ridership is taking the longest to recover and has not yet reached pre-coronavirus levels in most cities that have removed the lockdown. Um, and this is troubling given um, that public transit is an extremely efficient way to reduce our need for space and solve some of the congestion issues as at the same time addressing some of the issues of climate change and local air pollution. And so this really begs the question of what will be the lasting impact of coronavirus on public transit. And this is something that uh, keeps me up at night. Um, in many cities around the world, public transit already suffered a negative public image before the coronavirus. Um, and it was sort of seen as this foil to the personal car, which is this aspirational good. Um, here is an actual car advertisement um, where you see that the bus is, is seen as something for creeps and weirdos or people who are unsuccessful or poor. That is the image of a bus, um, even pre-coronavirus. Now the car is, is seen as something that brings social status. It's, it's something that people connect their personal image to um, when they own and use it. And this is something that we've termed car pride and have looked into um, in this mobility of the future study that, that Bob has mentioned. And, and really one of the questions is how, how do we stop this from this coronavirus from giving an even more negative image to, to public transit? How do we stop this from just being like, I was unsuccessful riding the bus and now it's a complete public health risk. Um, I'm, if I won't take it unless I absolutely have to. We need to be able to protect public health and maintain trust in our public transit systems. And I just wanna stress that the actions we take now in response to the pandemic will shape the future of urban transportation. I think Chris Knittle did a really good job of showing how um, economic shocks, even in the short term, like reduced investment in renewable energies over the next year or two years can have long-term consequences by putting us on higher cost pathways. We can see similar things when it comes to sort of social norming and behavioral change in transportation. And so there are policy measures that can help protect public health in the short term, but that also can help to encourage shifts to sustainable transportation in the long term. And this is what we need to be thinking about reclaiming street space for pedestrians and cyclists, increasing frequency of public transit service. And this is really important in the near term to offset reduced capacity due to physical distancing in vehicles. So many public transit agencies are blocking off um, certain seats and buses. They're reducing the number of people that are allowed on each vehicle so that people can maintain appropriate physical distance. These are really important measures, but what that means is that you can't serve as many trips as you might need to. And in order to, to actually serve all of the trips and provide the same capacity over time, you need to actually increase the frequency and improve the service. And this is not what we're seeing. We're actually seeing the opposite. We're seeing people taking, reducing services, cutting services. Um, and this is due to the fact that it is increased cost in the moment to run these services. But there is potentially long-term consequences of um, worsening service quality during, during this time. And sort of what does that mean for the public perception of these modes? Um, there's also encouraging work from home and flexible work hours where possible. And the localization of travel. So understanding that mixed-use development and community building, um, allowing people to better serve trips in a walkable or bikeable distance um, than con rather than concentrating all of the jobs in one area of the city and all of the residential areas in another. 
Now, there are other measures that protect public health in the short term that actually may have lasting and negative consequences for sustainable travel. Um, and I think that this is something that we need to, to think about how do we balance this short term concern about public health in our urban mobility systems with our understanding that we have long term goals uh, that are better for our society and for our economies. So I want to reiterate and just close with mode shift and behavior change have to be a fundamental part of any future sustainable urban transportation system. Um, Bob alluded to the fact that it takes a lot of time to develop and resources to develop new technology. And in the transportation space in particular, there's an even greater time after that technology has been developed for a decentralized market, like every single individual who's making a car purchase decision to actually adopt that new technology and have it penetrate at a, in a meaningful level. We can't wait for that technology to penetrate the urban mobility market. We have real externalities of urban transportation systems now um, that we need to start addressing with policy and behavior change um, using the technologies and the systems that we already have in place. So, and if we do have trips that have to be taken by car, I'm hoping that they will be electric and that they will be powered by green electricity. And so that's what we work on at my Energy Initiative. So I just want to thank everyone for their time and interest, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Joanna. That was great, um, as, as usual. So, so a couple of questions have come in uh, right away. Um, what one recurring theme is is about this trade-off congestion, uh, parking places in in urban areas. So, you, you mentioned the you sh that last slide you showed with pictures of how many people and what's the space for the vehicles, right? Uh, but what what is there an opportunity with reduced parking? So, what if you could reclaim some of the parking lots uh, in, in urban areas? Um, is that a mitigating factor for, for using autonomous vehicles, even, even though the volume per person is the same? Yeah, um, I think that there is, there's a lot of, there's a lot of factors that come in when you're talking about a potential autonomous vehicle future. Um, and there's a lot of unknowns. Um, I will be sort of a, a pessimist and I will answer it from my own sort of most educated guess of what's going to happen. Um, the first question is, are these going to be privately owned vehicles that are autonomous or are they going to be a fleet of vehicles like um, a taxi service that you hail, but there isn't a driver? Um, a lot of people assume that it's going to be a fleet based service. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily a fair assumption. I think both options are still up in the air and it could very well be a mixture of both. Now, Let's assume that it's a fleet-based service um, where you can hail that car um, and it will just be circulating around the city, right? The idea is it'll be circulating around the city, serving trips most of the time, so it doesn't need that much downtime, so you could repurpose parking lots. That is a potential, um, and I would like to see sort of parking lots in urban areas repurposed for mixed-use development that sort of bring um, a better mixture of residential, commercial, um, and other uses to the same area. Again, as this idea of localizing trips, trying to make it so that people will just have to travel as far um, or as much to get to the services and the amenities that they want to get to. Um, the other option is that because people no longer have to drive, they will just travel further. So, for example, why would I live um, within a 25 minute drive of my work when I could move to Cape Cod and live on the beach and then just get in my autonomous vehicle at 5 a.m. and sleep while it drives me to work? And that happens to be two hours away. Or I can read a book or I can watch my favorite television show. Um, now, there's, that's a big question because that's really going to require the highest level of autonomy autonomous technology to allow you to really do use your time in that way. Um, but I think there are some big questions and big unknowns about whether this will actually reduce people's travel. I think there is as much of a benefit as much of a potential 
that it will increase people's travel. Of course, then you're, you're living in your car instead of somewhere else. And, and there's the question whether if you, if you watch people on the Southeast Expressway in Boston, it's not clear they're already sleeping on their way to work or watching TV or something besides uh, uh, paying attention to traffic. Um, there, there was one question about the uh, fuel we didn't talk about, which is biofuels. Uh, so green biofuels, suppose we have uh, ethanol made from cellulose instead of uh, corn. Um, do you see that playing much of a role in, in uh, future light, light duty vehicles or, or, or other? Yeah, um, I will preface this with, again, I am a transportation person, um, not really an energy person. So if you ask me about the chemistry involved with this or a lot of the processes, I wouldn't be able to answer the details. Um, but my understanding from just working with fantastic colleagues at MIT Energy Initiative and around the Institute is that um, I think biofuels have a very limited role to play in the personal mobility space in the light duty vehicle market, um, but that they may have a role to play, uh, particularly for the sectors that are much harder to electrify. Um, or, and so these are going to be the long haul freight or something like an alternative to jet engine fuel. Um, and so that there are other parts of the transportation sector um, where you're going to need to see pretty different um, technologies and fuels um, introduced, particularly in the short term, um, as we are looking to decarbonize those, those sectors that are harder to electrify. Really interesting. Um, side note on the crisis, the pandemic, and, and its impact on biofuels. With less, uh, less personal vehicle driving, so less gasoline consumption, uh, that means with a 10% uh, addition of biofuels or ethanol, um, there's less less of that bioethanol being uh, being used, which means that a lot of the fermenters that are used to make make that ethanol are running less, and and that CO2 from those uh, actually is used in making carbonated beverages. There's a there's a good market there, and so so there's ironically a shortage of CO2 um, right now. It's a, at least a shortage of of CO2 for that particular application. Um, maybe it'd be good in the last five minutes uh, to, to get Chris back in. And uh, if we could get Chris back in, then I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question sort of aimed at, at the two of you. And, and that is, you, you, you talked about the desirability of, of higher frequency for, for public transit. Um, I, I'm partial to that since I, back when I was going to work, I was taking the subway. Uh, to work every day. Um, so higher frequency would be good to reduce the, the density, uh, but states and cities are broke, right? And, and uh, so there's a huge financial problem there. Um, and that's why I wanted Chris in for, for this. But it, so one of the questions from the audience said specific to that was, what, why don't we have autonomous subways, right? I mean, it's there we have a big labor cost. Um, I don't know about autonomous buses, but maybe dedicated lanes for buses. But what what about autonomy uh, in in that area? Well, the world has it. Um, so there are autonomous trains. That technology exists and is in operation uh, on a number of lines uh, in metro systems around the world. Um, and but what you actually see is that in most of those systems. Uh, there is still an operator on board. So you don't cut the costs completely. Um, and that, but that it does allow that operator or that personnel manning the train to serve more functions than just the train engineer. Um, they can have more passenger focused or amenity focused customer service type roles um, in addition to sort of monitoring the system. Um, but they do exist. Um, and there are many political pressures and economic pressures for why it is difficult to um, change a existing system to that newer system. It requires a complete overhaul of the signaling and the, um, the ICT, the information and communication technology that's used to um, communicate uh, with those trains and between the trains. So, Chris, do you have some thoughts on the economics here? And, and you know, it, we go back to that question about is this a good time to increase the, the gas tax? 
uh, is there cross fertilization there, or what 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 do you see as a possibility for states and cities to deal with this? Well, it's certainly a good time to increase the gas tax. Um, the The question is, where will the push money. push be to use that money? Um, and I'm not sure public transit is is probably going to be first in line there, uh, especially if we if we continue to see the drop in ridership, um, it'll just become less and less important. Um, but you know, we, as you know, um, the MBTA is always funds starved. Um, so, and, and many of the proposed gas taxes have been, uh, have been proposed to, to actually fund the MBTA. So that might be one of those projects where um, they have some, some positive spin or positive message as to what how to use those resources. So th there was an interesting question uh, raised by uh, someone who pointed out that that uh, although there's move to electrify vehicles, uh, people wanting to move to personal mobility, uh, and, and yet a lot of the manufacturers of electric vehicles are more interested, it seems, in making electric buses and and uh, other or mass transit vehicles. Do you see a, a way to square that? Well, electric buses actually, um, it, we recently did some analysis and I know the Mobility of the Future did analysis as well, but electric buses often have lower, lower payback periods uh, than personal electric vehicles. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of positives as to why electric bus network, you know, they all go to the same spot at the end of the day. Um, so you may only need one charging system. Um, you might be able to do inductive charging uh, at stops as well. Um, and they tend to, uh, you know, have obviously have predetermined paths. So you can, there's a big resource planning optimization program there as well. Um, and I know what, Joanna probably knows that China has 400,000 electric buses um, in the market now. Yeah, I mean, I will, I will say that I think that the electrification of public transport is incredibly important. I think it's especially important in the global south, um, where often the public transit vehicles um, are privately operated um, or sort of paratransit or informal transit systems. So these are often not the, the traditional 40 foot bus that you see um, on a street in Boston, uh, but maybe 14 passenger um, sort of mini bus taxis or other, other types of services. Um, and those vehicles tend to be uh, fairly old. And because of that, um, have pretty poor catalytic converter technology um, and uh, fuel efficiency. And so what that means is that they're actually extremely polluting um, and are large contributions uh, to the air quality, particularly local air quality issues that you're seeing in um, the cities in the global south. Uh, they have lower personal motorization and so public transit is a bigger part of the air pollution in those cities. And so the electrification and, or really just the, um, renewal of those fleets um, can have a huge impact on the local air quality um, and we can see co-benefits with greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions there. Good. Um, I know that we're thanks. really out of time, but I wanna just make a quick point based on uh, the, the question that Chris fielded about sort of density. Um, and I just wanna demystify that I do not think the coronavirus is the death of density. We need cities. There are many very, very dense cities that are counterexamples to New York. Um, Hong Kong, Singapore, and many others that have huge, pop really dense populations um, that have weathered the outbreak uh, much better. And so we as sort of scientists and as people in this space with data need to be able to counter that and to say that cities are have particular challenges and we do need to address those, but that just moving to the suburbs isn't the answer. Good. Chris? <laughs> <laughs> no, 
Uh, Joanna is speaking. I, I was just talking about consumer uh, yeah. preferences. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. You, you know, we know those aren't always driven by facts and, um, and often oh. driven by perception. Um, so that was where I was coming from. I wasn't making a statement that the society should move toward to the suburbs. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, 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 that's been an interesting sort of sub theme as as we look at autonomous vehicles is is do people then move out uh, so you get a cheaper house and then you just spend uh, more of your time commuting but you're not actually spending your time doing that of course that requires level five autonomy and uh, I think that's uh, out there on the horizon for quite quite a ways yet so I I, I see we're we're over time at this point and I want to respect the panelists. Uh, time and, and the audience's time. Um, uh, CJ, if you want to jump back on momentarily, I just w want to to thank uh, CJ and ILP for for work in in putting this together with with Mighty. I want to thank Lou Carranza, at, at his associate director at Mighty, who's done a lot of the the work in in thinking about the the lineups for this week, next week, and the the following week. Uh, and most of all, I want to thank uh, Chris and Joanna and uh, Elsa for, for great presentations and, and for the audience uh, who we, we had, uh, we were right at 400 people uh, on the audience uh, um, for, for, for part of the, the session. So a lot of people tuned in and, and I think it was a great set of questions that came as a result and good discussion. So thank you. Thank you, CJ. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, thanks, Bob and Chris, Elsa and uh, John. Great, great talks. Uh, and also, thank you, thank you for all the participating from all around the world. I know some of you join us uh, from the very late evenings, uh, but I hope we agree that those are great leading edge thinking and uh, presentations, and uh, not only leading edge uh, research, but also closely related to the activity in the real world. So that's why both ILP and Mighty uh, uh, stress the collaboration between the industry and MIT research. So hope you join us uh, next week, uh, May 13th, the same time, starting 11 a.m. And the third one on May 21st, starting uh, 10 a.m., both uh, uh, U.S. East Standard Time. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Good. Thank you. Goodbye.